Welcome to another Food Plotters Journal podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping landowners grow better food plots with less equipment, less work, and more success. My name is Randy Vanderveen of Strategic Habitat. My co-host is John Comp of Northwoods Whitetail Food Plot Seed. In this episode, John and I talk about a better, faster way to build up your soil and organic matter than growing just a single planting of buckwheat in the summer. John also talks about the positive feedback he got last year from landowners about the new strain of RC Big Rock switchgrass growing much faster than cave and rock and what prep and planting method works best for different soil types. We also talk about a new blend of forbs and forage he has for providing some additional areas of browse within large switchgrass bedding areas. And finally, John talks about his new affordable line of five foot wide roller crimpers designed specifically for ATVs and a new 6x6 six six scent tight hunting blind that won't break the bank. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Now let's jump right into the call with John. Hey, how you doing, John? Good, Randy. How are you doing tonight? Real good. How's everything so far in 2023 as far as food plot seed sales going? Pretty good. Holding steady. You know, uh, economy's not the greatest. A lot of turmoil in the world right now, but uh, we're doing just fine. Good. So are, are you guys kind of behind up there a little bit as far as snow melt? I mean, you guys uh, got a lot on the ground yet in the woods? Some of the swamps, we have to drive through one of the swamps to get to the hunting property. And I still think there's probably a foot and a half to two feet of snow. But here at, here at home, our food plot is probably half green already with uh, six to eight inches of snow and ice on the other half so it's getting there but it's uh man we did not need that snow uh the beginning of april yeah yeah that was a tough one no i down in uh you know southern michigan it's, it's really kind of a unique winter because you know we've had a lot of snow this year um grand rapids has had i think we're up to about 104 inches now for the year wow. but it, it's always come in like in, in big doses. You know, we had uh, a snow event, 18 inches one time, 23 inches another time. I think we had, wow. you know, 12 another time. So it added up quick, but it uh, every, seemed like every time we had a big snow event, it melted within, you know, seven to 10 days. So really, you know, a lot of our food plots have been pretty bare uh, this whole winter. And there's been deer on it uh, almost every day. And that food plot is still green. I mean, it's it's probably just about two acres, and the deer just cannot get it eaten down to dirt, you know. So it's been doing its job all winter long, and now it's just about ready to start popping. So just a great thing. Right. And you think about rye and crimson clover, and that might not be the highest, you know, the highest rung on the ladder. It might almost be, in a lot of people's mind, the lowest rung on the ladder for what you want to plant food plots but you know when you said central michigan obviously we're probably dealing with sandy soil so that's a great planting but two um i just think cereal rye you know in northern half of the country you have to have it in your food plots you know if you want to help the deer herd and it's not so much a hunting situation whereas it's now where where the snow is melting and these deer are, are desperately seeking some green food They've been eating, you know, woody browse and shrubs and sticks and leaves and twigs all winter long. And now you start to put that, you know, does have fawns uh, being, getting ready to be born. You've got bucks trying to uh, put some, um, you know, structure back on their body and some antlers on their, on their head. And that, you know, anywhere from 12 to 15, depending on what reports you look at, rye content, 12 to 15 percent in that rye, plus that crimson clover, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better way to get the deer out of winter than, than a food plot full of those uh, goodies. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, the crimson clover, John, do you normally, when I'm up in extreme northern climates, you know, maybe on the uh, the west side of Lake Michigan where it really gets cold, um, sure. you know, red clover is probably the thing to go to because it overwinters better than the crimson. But what about the balanza clover? Do you find that that overwinters a little bit better than the crimson? Um, we're going to find out this year because we did a lot of blends up, uh, in our garden and some of our food plots, because we crimp our garden every year, the rye, and mm-hmm. we use some blends this year in replacement of crimson clover for the fall planting, the cover crop planting. So I'll be able to answer that question probably, you know, maybe in a month or two. Um, and then I do know that the deer in our food plot where we had it in the food plots, they ate it. So 
I think that's just going to be one more addition. We'll probably bring some in here if I really like the results. I'm very curious to see how it crimps because uh, it does have, it seems to have a lot longer stem or the red. So mm -hmm. I'm very interested to try it, but yeah, we're going to find out how that blends. It. Yeah. Okay. But like you said, with some of these sandy plots up in Northern Michigan, you know, I mean, there's um, r really hardly a, a faster way to build organic matter, you know, than running two cycles right. of, of green plants, you know, every year. And, you know, your soil builder, man, what a, you know, it's just a, just a fantastic way to build some, some biomass, you know, on some of these food plots mm -hmm. that just, it's crap soil, you know, so the well, organic matter is, is so huge. And a lot of times, like in central Michigan, northern Michigan, UP, central Wisconsin, you know, when I look at a soil test from that region, my eyes kind of drift towards the organic matter first before I look at the pH, because I think, in my opinion, it's more important to get that organic matter number fixed first and pH is a close second. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it yep. just limits when your organic matter is low, it's going to really limit on what you can or cannot plant. Right. You know, and listening to Gabe Brown and reading some of his stuff, you know, he's all about, uh, you know, if you really want to create, uh, you know, organic matter fast, obviously always got to have something green and growing. But number two, basically, he's always talking about diversity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, ju just to go with, uh, you know, a single planting, like, you know, a guy just wants to plant oats or even like in the springtime, you know, for the summer, somebody just plants buckwheat, you know, it's just, you're not reaching your full potential, you know, to uh, amend no. soil and build organic matter with just a single planting like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the buck doing that buckwheat roll down method, and I think that's a good method in certain parts of the country. But if you're really trying to move that organic matter number, if you look at a buckwheat plant that's been in the ground six, maybe seven weeks, because you have to roll that buckwheat down or you have to kill it so it doesn't go to seed, pollute, so to speak, your fall planting with, you know, a million little buckwheat plants. That buckwheat that's in the ground six or seven weeks, the root ball, the root mass on it is maybe the size of a, not even a ping pong ball. Mm -hmm. That's very small. And you're not going to move that number very much in sandy soil. That's where something like our soil builder comes in because we've got, I think we're up to nine species. And then if you add some either blondes or clover or crimson, you're at 10 species, I believe, nine or 10 species. And some of those species have tremendous root system. And from everything I've understand and read, a majority of your organic matter comes from the root system, you know, not that residue on top of the ground. That residue on top of the ground is the armor on the soil, you know, protecting from, mm -hmm. you know, rose and wind damage, sun and, and uh, that kind of thing. But the number mover is the root system. And again, I think buckwheat roll down method has its place if you're not trying to build organic matter. I mean, if you've got good soil, you've got consistent moisture, you know, rain, I think that's a great method. But if you're really trying to move that organic matter number, I don't think you're going to move it as quickly as say something like our soil builder. Yeah. Yeah. I think buckwheat is really good for suppressing weeds. Yep. If that's what sure. you're trying to do. Yeah. Kind of curious about your um, new pollinator blend. You getting a lot of inquiries about that? Yeah, I think I think that that Forbes and Forge you were talking about, and actually, uh, you were here in December with Jake and Elliot and Brad Harper, and we had talked to you guys about that kind of analyze the uh, the seed list, and it's it's doing quite well. We get a lot of calls about it, you know, and it's it's kind of something different. Like when we discussed it when you were here, you know, we're not we're not putting a food plot so to speak, in the bedding areas, but we're just enhancing, uh, you know, woody brows. We're just adding some green forbs. A lot of them are going to be frost tolerant. So if you had a lot of oh, goldenrod in your bedding areas that you were counting on as forbs, some of those might be dead with frost. And we've got some forbs that are going to be frost tolerant. Now, this isn't clover or brassicas or oats or rye or anything like that. It's just a list of forbs that we talked about that we felt would enhance something like a hinge cut, woody brows, uh, regen area that deer use for daytime bedding. Yeah, I've been recommending that to some guys who, you know, they got a bunch of extra open space. They're not really quite sure what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And um, it, uh, you know, they really don't want to plant everything in switchgrass. So, you know, this uh, forbs and forage blend that you have, I think um, I I've had some guys pretty interested 
interested in it. So hopefully um, I, I'm going to try it a little bit too at uh, a property mm -hmm. that I'm working on as well, see how that does. And uh, we got quite a bit of switchgrass yeah. to uh, plant over there. So did John, does that come in um, 25 pound bags or just 10 pound you know, bags? How's that come? Right now it's just, I think it's a three pound bag. And you know, the, the one problem that I found as soon as we got it made is I'm not a big fan of big seed, little seed in the food plots, you know, in the, in the blends. I like, mm -hmm. you know, big seeds and, and there's, there's a, you know, if you look at a goldenrod, there's some goldenrod component in here. It's, it's the size of a clover seed. And then there's some other forbs in there that are the size of a BB. So I think planting is going to be a little bit of a challenge. You know, I think three pounds is going to go a long way because if you look at our pollinator blend, it's seven pounds. So this little three pound bag could quite honestly be a half acre's worth of seed. Now, what we're telling folks is that we're not trying to put, you know, let's say we've got a diversity pocket the size of your garage. Okay. We're not planting the whole thing in this diversity pocket. Maybe mm -hmm. if you've got poor seed bank, if you're in like, like you were up at our property that we're hunting on. And there's not a lot of seed bank there. It's a lot of bracken fern. So we might use mm -hmm. a little bit more, say, compared to somebody like in a CRP ground in, in Illinois or Iowa, where there's probably a really fantastic seed bank for broadleaves and forbs, you might just have only need a handful. So I think it's going to vary uh, parcel to parcel how much people are going to need with this. But I just think it's something that's going to enhance uh, the daytime bedding areas. Okay. So, um, I got to believe you're getting a lot of questions about uh, switchgrass. You know, when can I frost seed? When can I spray Roundup? All that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you getting a lot of that right now? Yeah, we are, and actually, um, we've we've got a YouTube channel now. We're we're uh, we're doing. I think we've talked about this three times in our first thirty videos. Um, with this RC line of switchgrass, you know, you it's it's going to be traditionally planted the same way as, you know, your cave and rocks or your Shawnees or, or, or um, you know, what have you. But the RC switchgrass, people have to understand, this is a brand new variety to the country, to the states. It's, it's, I believe it's only 10 years old, whereas most everything else offered to a whitetail land manager, 30 and 40 year old varieties. Now the seed's not that old, but the variety is, okay? And mm -hmm. with that older variety comes slower growth, low vigor, and it just is not out of the ground as quick as this RC. Now, talking with Roger Sampson, the gentleman who actually developed and bred the RC line of switchgrass, the RC Tecumseh, RC Big Rock, RC Chippewa, he said they've seen the seed pop at 49 degrees. Okay. Wow. So now that really takes the option of frost seeding and spraying Roundup out of the equation. You can't do it anymore. Uh, we've got a very good Haven Rock switchgrass, but we've also got that RC switchgrass. And I just tell folks, do not do it. Do not spray Roundup. Once that seed's on the ground, don't spray Roundup. You're going to kill it. You've got a very good chance of killing it. We were seeing pictures from Ohio, um, southern Ohio, last week of seed germinating already. So Yeah, isn't that um, crazy? It's crazy. I mean, and this is this is a brand, you know, it's, it's almost, uh, I was talking to uh, a gentleman who said it's almost like it's a row crop now. It grows so fast and it comes out of the ground so quickly. So I highly recommend folks do not frost seed and then try to spray your way out of it because you're going to kill. I've seen it. I've seen folks ruin $2,000 worth of seed um, because they had someone come and spray Roundup and they sprayed too late and they killed the whole field. So Mm -hmm, I just man. don't think that's good advice anymore, especially with the sunset line of switchgrass. But again, Randy, you can plant it. You know, the two weeks we recommend folks is you do your spraying July, August, and September, and then frost seed it either before the snow or when the snow is melting. Or if you want to, you do a simazine spraying uh, right pretty quick. Uh, and then some 2,4-D and Roundup a few weeks uh, right after spring green up. And then maybe uh, four weeks later, one more spraying of Roundup. And then you can broadcast and roll it in or drill it. I really like, if you're going to plant in the spring, I really like uh, folks to drill it. I think it's very effective. Um, but if you get adequate rain, um, by all means, you can broadcast it and have a successful stand. I think the highest we saw in Michigan last year, uh, I think a gentleman uh, planted his in June and had five and a half feet tall RC Big Rock. And I believe I saw five foot tall RC Tecumseh. 
both planted wow. in June. It's, it's an amazing, amazing product. So yeah. Yeah, I was on a property today in the Cadillac area, and the landowner planted RC Big Rock and Tecumseh, and mm -hmm. blended it together. And and okay. yeah, I mean that's not, mm -hmm. um, you know you you picked up one of those uh, stalks. I, I bet you there was you know three and a half feet. You know, and he's in sandy soil. It's not the greatest soil up there by mm -hmm. Cadillac. So um, sure. you know that's that's one year. So you know he's yep. very encouraged and. You know, it's just really a game changer. So, you know, so many people are um, kind of freaked out about all the horror stories they hear about trying to grow switchgrass and it gets overtaken mm -hmm. by weeds. But, you yep. know, that's the beauty of this stuff. It just outpaces it and it, it, you know, jumps out of the ground way before a lot of that competition. Yes. Does, so. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to my point with Roundup. If this stuff's popping, let's just say, you know, that 49 degrees isn't going to happen all the time. You know, low 50s is quite possible. A lot of these warm season grasses and weeds, you're not going to see them till the soil temperature is 60, 65 degrees. So you're really not doing yourself any good by spraying Roundup anymore. You know, if this stuff's popping at, say, 55 degrees and all that other warm season stuff popping at 65, it's just, it's, you're not doing anything. You're not, there's nothing there to kill. It's not there yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw a gentleman on YouTube talking about, you know, you can, you can, uh, spray as long as the, the farmer's corn isn't up. And I thought, man, you couldn't be further from the truth. You're just, you, that's just <laughs> such bad advice. And, and uh, unfortunately, someone's going to see that and do that. And then we'll get a phone call because uh, it happened a couple of times where I saw this on YouTube and this guy said that I can, I can spray if the corn's not up. Well, he killed his whole field, you know? Mm. So yeah, it's, it's a it's a shame, you know that. But but that's the that's the beauty of this new RC line of switchgrass. It just comes out so fast. Now I don't want people to think that they can just go plant it and not do weed control. We still recommend you know the three springs in the fall and the frost seeding, or two or three springs in the spring, and then seed it. You still have to do weed control. But if it's not as good, it like you said, this has got such vigor, it comes out of the ground and it does quite well. Um, you might have to do some mowing and stuff. Boy, that second year, it just look out. I think that that uh, land you were on today, if you had three feet already, he's gonna. If you know, if we get some decent moisture in the summer, he could easily see seven feet this year. Oh man, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt. Yeah, so he's yeah, he should be pretty excited so, for that. <clears throat> yeah. So Monday, I was um, spraying simazine um, on a on about oh four or five acres and around the Battle Creek area and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, shoot, it it's so sandy over there. You know that um, I, I think you know in sandy areas, man. If you can if you can drill that, and I think you mentioned that before, you know you'd mm -hmm. almost recommend drilling it if it's in sandy soil. You know, but uh, if you got you know good yeah. quality soil and it's amended and little to no weed competition because you did some prior spraying, yeah, I think broadcasting and rolling you'd probably get away with it if if you got the rain. You know, but yeah. Yeah, just mm -hmm. in that sandy ground, boy, I don't like, I mean, whether it's switchgrass or rye or clover or anything, if it's sandy ground, I'm I'm really hesitant uh, in June to be put into a drought condition because that sand is just, it dries out so quickly. And I, you know, <clears throat> I tell folks that if you are going to plant in sand, you've got two months now to to try to find, line up a drill, you know, and I, and, and, and I, I try not to spend folks money. But what I tell them is that, I would rather see you do it right the first time, you know, and this is now we're just, we're talking about sandy ground. If, if you know, if you're in, you know, right. good soil, you can get away with broadcasting, I think, because their moisture retention is a lot better in that ground. Um, mm -hmm. But I, if you've got sandy ground, now we've got, you know, you were at our property and you saw the sandy ground, we're going to do everything we can to drill all our switchgrass this year. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just would recommend that to folks. Try to find somebody, you know, if you have to go in with a buddy on a drill, you do your property in the morning and his property in the afternoon. Um, that's what I would like to see. Get that seed covered uh, in that sandy ground. Yeah. So, John, I've, I've heard the term, uh, you know, hard seed in switchgrass. Right. So what what is that exactly? So, you know, again, getting to talk to probably the most experienced man I've ever talked to about switchgrass. The gentleman, Roger Sampson, is a wealth of knowledge on switchgrass. And we've had this conversation, and actually we're going to try to do a video with him, or, or he's going to explain it to me, and we're going to do a video. But uh, it's not really hard seed that I was <clears throat> I was led to believe. It's, it's, it's really, it's called dormant seed. Now, dormant seed, so I believe the way I, it was explained to me, so let's say you're doing 100 seeds, 200 seed seed tests, 
and they might do a 14 day test and 60% of those seeds popped. And then the other 38% did not pop. So it's, they're going to label it as a 60% hard, I'm sorry, 60% germ, 38% dormant, or what typically people know right now as hard seed, which is fact mm. called dormant seed. But mm -hmm. Roger said that 21 days, a lot more of it popped, and then at by 25 days to 30 days, it's all it's all popped. So if they would have ran a 30 day test, it would have been zero dormant seed. But because they only ran 14 day test, and 60 percent of the seed went, they still labeled it 38 percent dormant. Although the next two weeks, the rest of that seed popped. Now the the numbers might the day numbers might be, I might be off a little bit. But, you know, just for explanation's sake, I'm trying to simplify it. But now this is just with the RC line, okay? There is a lot of seed, like we were talking about these 20, 30, 40-year-old varieties that are out there. You will actually have to wait the following year for all your seed to pop. That is true. But with this RC line, that, for the most part, is not the case anymore. So, again, it's a completely different animal than what we've been planting uh, you know, for the last 20, 30 years in the whitetail uh, landscape. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you've, you've done it before. Explain how you yep. do a germ test just to see if the germ, you know, if the seed is any good. I don't know if I would do this with switchgrass. I think it'd be pretty tough. I would actually plant the switchgrass in a couple of pots, take 100. Um, but let's say we're going to, so we germ test every lot that we get in with our, our food slot screen. Okay. We'll take mm -hmm. 200 seeds, we'll roll them up in a piece of paper towel, nice and tight, kind of like you're wrapping a Christmas present, and we will dab a little bit of water on it, put it in a glass jar or a glass, and set it in the window. Now, it can't be a window in the north part of the house. It'll never get the right amount of sun. Okay, so it's got to get some sun. I think our kitchen window faces east, so it gets half a day of sun. And then you don't want standing water in the bottom of the glass. You just want that paper towel to stay moist. And you might have to drop a couple of drops on it every few days. So, you know, after two weeks, I'll start to see roots poking through the paper towel. Uh, we'll start to see leaves starting to come out of the paper towel. I'll open it up. Be very careful when you open it up. It could, you know, the, the paper towel is going to be pretty compromised. And you just count the seeds that threw a root. And you might have a couple of seeds that didn't throw a root. So let's say, you know, out of the 200 seeds, uh, what would that be? 180 seeds through a root, 90%. Is that math right? Mm -hmm. I failed math. Yep. <laughs> so I anyway, yep. But so that's why, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and I can, you know, we just basically, I'll throw a handful in there and I can kind of look at it and, and get it pretty close on what's popping and what's not. And, you know, the other thing is you could take those seeds that didn't throw a root and keep going with the test just to see, you know, um, but mm -hmm. we, every year we get the, we seem to have, we seem to have a few folks that have a failure, whether they planted too shallow, uh, they planted the, it was too cold and, you know, they, they kind of question, which is, you know, they're right. They question the viability of our seed and we send them, okay, on, uh, you know, April 5th, we pulled out of this lot, this lot is what you bought, you know, and we'll work with them on what happened. We just want folks to reassure, be reassured that, you know, not only, uh, the, there's a laboratory that tests every one of our seeds that's on the shelf here. There's a lot of them we'll actually do ourselves just as, you know, kind of a peace of mind for us and as well as our customers. But yeah, germ test, yeah. if you've got seed left over, just about anything other than switchgrass, like I said, if I was doing switchgrass, I'd probably just actually get a few pots and put 50 seeds in each pot or 25 seeds in each pot and I'd do it that way. Yeah, and then just count the mm -hmm. blades as they come out of the ground. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Forbes and Forge blend. Uh, do, you, do you have anything new on the shelves uh, for 2023? Yeah, we've got a few things. We've got a, it's not on the site yet, but we are just finalizing a wet ground clover. You know, there's a lot of folks in Michigan that have to plant in sandy ground, but then there's a lot of folks that are planting and trying to do food plots where it's, it's uh, going to be quite damp. And there's not a lot of products that like wet ground. I think it's easier to grow a food plot uh, in sandy soil than it is not so much flooded, but it's, you know, pretty white ground. And we're working mm -hmm. on a clover for that. We've got uh, just with the success of our chicory, we're going to do just a straight uh, two-pound bag of chicory in case folks want to add it to their clover plots. 
When would you plant that sugary, well, John? Probably frost seeded or uh, spring seeded, you know, when there's not a lot of uh, competition for the chicory uh, okay. to, to grow. One of the things we're actually going to do um, when when we do our three strip system on some of these sandy grounds that, that you were up here looking at, where I don't think brassica is going to work, <clears throat> we're actually going to put chicory in instead, just pure chicory instead of a brassica planting, because that chicory is going to still grow in that sand. You know, it's got the deep tap root. And so instead of a grain strip, clover strip, brassica strip, we're going to try a grain strip, try to find a clover that's going to work, and then a chicory strip and see how that works. It's just something different because we cannot get brassicas to grow up there. I tried a small spot, and the soil is just is years away from being ready. But we want to offer diversity up there, so we're going to try a small spot. We're going to just do a strip of straight chicory and see how that works. And that's kind of... You know, we we we're, we understand that not everybody's soil is the same. You know, the the folks that are blessed down in you know the the Iowa's, we're not necessarily blessed here in Michigan with that same type of soil. But that doesn't mean we can't have diversity in our food plots. That we just have to stick with cereal grains. So we're going to run that chicory as a replacement for brassica. So uh, that's mm, another thing okay. we got. I really really anxious to try. We're probably going to do a spring planting with our chicory, uh, and then we've got the newest. Uh, Tacticam are here. We're a Tacticam dealer, but we got the Tacticam Reveal X Pro. Uh, pretty pretty cool. This has got a couple of things, and I think you really like this one, Randy, because you're a big fan of this, the black flash technology. They can't see the flash on the camera. Um, you know, a lot of the cameras out there have that infrared, and you can see that red glow. This does not have that. And then the no. other thing is that um, it's got a built-in GPS tracking, so if somebody helps themselves to your camera, you can track it. Yeah, I could have used that about three years ago when I had about three <laughs> cameras ripped off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 um, I'm going to have another conversation with the uh, salesman at Tacticam, but that's what he was talking about. And you can, I believe you can change from picture to video right from your phone. You know, there's an app with it. So, yeah, we've got a lot of, lot of neat stuff here. I think that the, the most exciting one, and you actually got to see this when you were up here, we've got our own our own line of deer stands. We're just finishing up. Uh, we got the first one built. Uh, you got to come see it, give us some, uh, you know, pointers on it. Uh, we already got some changes we want to do, but the proto the, the prototype is done. Uh, again, we've always wanted our own deer stand. This is all wood construction, steel roof, glass windows. Um, I think it's about a scent free blind or scent proof blind as you can get. It's sealed windows. Uh, we're pretty excited about that, and hopefully we'll be able to show people that in the next two to three weeks. So, um, awesome. And then finally, our first two roller crimpers are heading out the door, I think, in the next oh, wow. two weeks. So, yep, nice. yep, a lot of cool stuff happening here. So, you know, not we're just not about food plus seed anymore. We're starting to get into helping folks with the things that uh, people really want. But, you know, I think I've always been a guy that likes to tinker with stuff, and I looked at some of these deer blinds that are on the market, and, I thought, you know what, I think we can build a better one for a lot less money. And, and uh, you know, we use that T111 siding, and, and uh, I've got a shed in my backyard that's over 20 years old. It's got that T111 on it. My uncle's cabin is uh, maybe 30 years old, 25 years old, and he's got the T111 siding on it. And it looks like the day they built it, you know, 20, 25 wow. years ago. So it's it's going to be uh, a blind that you can buy, and, and that's it, and you're done with it. You know, I think I, I don't see – you know, obviously you could break a window or, or you know, something crazy could happen. Um, but I don't see, you know, this thing falling apart in three years like a lot of the blinds you see out there nowadays. Just one size, John, or do you have a couple different sizes available? For now, it's just the six by six. The peak is, uh, I think it's eight feet, uh, seven and a half foot ceiling on the inside. It's a peak drill. Oh, man. It's just six by six. We might sell one. We might sell 50. I have no idea. But it's something we've always wanted to do. Now we've got the room here in the shop in the yard. Uh, once the weather warms up, we're going to be able to start building those. So uh, mm -hmm. pretty cool. Like I said, the roller crimpers are heading out the door. Uh, one's going to St. Louis, and one of them's going to southwest Wisconsin. So we'll build the next two pretty quick. Uh, we've okay. got quotes. Yeah, we've got folks asking for quotes for the six-foot three-point model and then a quote for a eight-foot three-point model. We've got a great fabricator who knocked these right out of the park. He did an awesome job. Guy right here in Menominee. Um, so yeah, we're, um, pretty excited about that to get that out the door and, uh, yeah, a lot of cool things happening. 
So, so the uh, two sizes on the crimper, you got a six footer and an eight footer. Now, yeah, those yeah. are the two that we quoted for a couple of folks with tractors and three point models. But the ones that are heading out the door now are the five foot ATV models that. Oh, okay, awesome. Website. Yep, yep. You, and yeah. and actually, I, I hooked some ours up. I think we test ran it in uh, mid July last year. I hooked it up to mm-hmm. a Honda 450 Foreman, and it didn't even filled it with water. Didn't even know it was back there. And I, I was going oh, fast, wow. turning sharp corners to make sure it wasn't going to dig in or anything. But no, this is the Chevron pattern. You know, it's it's built really, really nice. It's got heavy duty bearings. I'm I'm kind of the guy. I like I told the guys on the fab shop, I want this thing built once. I understand. You know, you might get a flat tire. It's got um, snow. It's got utility trailer wheels on it. Heavy duty bearings for transport. It's a flip over design. Heavy duty roller bearings greasable bearings and i told the guys look i you know these things are going to get used and you know they're going to be hitting rocks and you know they're going to be somebody might take it down a gravel road because they don't want to flip it over and let's make it so they only have to buy it once and not replace anything on it so it's built heavy duty it's under four thousand dollars and really really proud of the job those guys did the fact that it's uh, be you know you can pull it with an ATV and it's under four grand, I think that's going to be really attractive to a lot of guys. Yeah, one of the things we decided we don't paint them. So one of the rollers we're we're uh, we're painting it for the for the gentleman I believe is in St. Louis. So we're going to have we have a shop right around the corner that can blast it and paint it. You know it'll probably be uh, anywhere from three hundred seventy five to five hundred dollars by the time that's all done. And then there's another gentleman that bought one down in Wisconsin. They're just going to go to the hardware store and buy four cans of, uh, you know, self, self-etching epoxy paint. And they're going to do it themselves to the tune of maybe $55, $60. So, you know, yeah. we, we like to save uh, people money. If they want it painted, we can paint it. If they want to do it themselves and save, uh, save some money, they can do that. We actually had a, a farmer out in California call us, and we're just trying to figure out how to get it out there. But, but yeah, they're probably good. they're going to buy one too. So pretty excited about nice. that. I never thought we'd get into building them. You know, I thought we'd build maybe one or two a year, but now we've got quotes of all the way up to I think six now. So pretty pretty oh, excited wow. about that too. So yep, yeah, pretty neat stuff going on out here. Yeah, that's great. Well, hey, I'm uh, I'm really enjoying your uh, YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that uh, underneath this video. But uh, oh, YouTube, yeah, you, you, what's the name of the YouTube channel, Jan? It's just Northwoods Whitetail Food Plot Seeds. We've got videos on how we recommend planting brassica with the earthway cedar, um, how to build organic matter in your food plots. We have customers, we have a website or an email address. Customers can ask us questions. We actually, once a month, we'll answer those questions. We'll do a, we'll do a I don't know if you call it a show or a, a video on answering customers' questions. And the engagement is, is pretty amazing. I mean, I think, you know, we don't, we don't do... I do all the editing. I do all the videoing. Um, I'm not, I don't do a lot of B-roll or anything like that. I just, I think that's what, what's drawing a lot of people to it. It's just, this is what we're talking about. You know, I've got it up on a blackboard and we do the, we go through the video quickly and we're, you know, six to eight minutes or done. So I like doing it. I think, uh, you know, I I always tell folks, I really like informed customers. Uh, I like informed, uh, you know, people that are looking for, you know, answers and questions. And there's a million YouTube channels out there. And I think a lot of them, uh, I don't know how to put this politically correct, really offer bad advice. <laughs> um, no, I, I just, honestly, I'm just trying to be honest. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of good YouTube channels out there as far as the hunting industry goes, but there's a lot mm-hmm. of guys out there that are trying to make a name for themselves. And they just, they just, I don't know how to put it, put it politely. They just don't know what they're talking about. And it, it and, and I'll use the, that example of a guy talking about go ahead and spray uh roundup when the farmer's corn isn't up. And I, I, you know, that's just, it's terrible advice. So I want yeah. folks that are Northwoods customers to get it right from my mouth, you know, and uh, obviously like uh, talking with you tonight, uh, we get our message out and, and things, you know, uh, that are important to us and information that we both think helps folks. And uh, that's why we had to start that channel, just trying to wade through a lot of the, I don't know, misinformation, <laughs> fake yep, news. I don't yep. know. But yeah, that's, yep. we, you know, it, it was, it was tough to get it going, but now it, you know, it, I think we're up well, oh, we're almost pushing 70 videos. So, but it's uh, Northwoods Whitetails Food Plots is our YouTube channel. 
we'll, we'll put this podcast on your uh, YouTube channel as well. And, sure. um, you know, sure. I, I, I would encourage people, you know, so if, if somebody has a, a question about, you know, how do you plant this or when do you plant that or what, what's mm-hmm. the best option for X, Y, and Z, you know, mm-hmm. I would encourage people just to go to your YouTube channel, Northwoods Whitetail Food Plot Seed, and click on the videos tab. And, you know, when you scroll down, you've got your titles, you know, very descriptive. So I'll bet mm-hmm. you if somebody had a question about something pertaining to food plots, they could probably find the answer on one of the videos, you know, and, and you know, they're not going to have to wonder, man, is this good advice or not? Because you're, you're given sound advice, John, because, you know, your, your products are on the line. People are using your products and you want right. them to plant it at the right time, at right. the right depth, you know, and, and in the right type of soil, all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all about trying to help people not fail because food pot failure is just way too common out there. Right. Well, you know, and I tell folks, I am a seed company trying to do a YouTube channel. I'm not a YouTube channel trying to sell right. seed. And there's right. a reason yep. why we started this channel and trying to get the correct information, whether it's through a video or I'm talking on the phone or a text message or an email to a Northwoods customer the stuff that we're talking about on our channel, on our videos, is the exact same information like we discussed tonight or I'll discuss in the video. It's the same information. It's not because somebody actually bought seed from us and, and then picked up the phone and say, hey, I need this question answered. No, it's the same information. Um, and actually, Randy, a lot of, you know, we've got a list of videos, like 50 videos we want to do, but then we start talking to people every day. I'm usually on the phone, great problem to have. Not really a problem, but it's a great situation to be in. We get to talk three to five hours a day to folks, whether it's answering questions, designing the food plot program. And a lot of the stuff that we talk about comes from those conversations we have with people. And like what we talked about um, last night, we got these questions in March, and this was probably of all the questions we got, these were the top five. And we'll do something like that. So, but, you know, we're very engaging. I tell people that as long as I'm awake, I'm going to answer the phone, answer an email, answer a text, you know, as long as I'm not out to dinner with my family, because that's what we do, you know, being a business owner. Um, and I think our customer service second to none, we, we try to engage with people and whether it's, if it's a YouTube question, I don't think there's too many YouTube questions. There's probably hundreds of questions on our, on all our videos. I think there might be half a dozen that we might not have gotten to yet, maybe 10 that we haven't gotten to yet. You know, if, if people have questions, you know, we can answer them. We can, we might put it on the but I just think it's a great resource for whether you're a Northwoods customer or you're buying a product very similar to Northwoods and you still have questions. I think it's, it's going to be a great resource for people. Uh, we're doing a lot of habitat. I'm sorry. We're doing a lot of food plot videos now. Uh, we can get Jake and, and, and you up here. We're hoping to do some habitat videos soon. So, um, you know, just the way we see things and uh, looking forward to that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you, that's a, that's a rare breed in today's, you know, corporate world where customers can actually get a hold of, of an owner of a seed company and, and run some questions by him. And actually the guy will answer his phone and give him, you know, some straight answers. So. Um, right. And I'd have a, it, a, I would not have it any other way here. I'm the one answering yep. the phone. I just, I don't think I would trust that kind of a relationship to anybody else. If our name's on yep. the bag, you're going to talk to the guy whose name's on the bag. That's what I believe. Yeah. Well, and that's what I tell all my clients too. You know, I say, Hey, John is a trusted source, good quality seed. And if you got questions, you know, nine times out of 10, he's going to answer that phone. Uh, first time you call him and uh, we try. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get, I get lots of good reports. Even like today, you know, the guy was, uh, and then raving about uh, the brassicas, he gets sweet piece brassicas. I mean, they, they look beautiful, you know? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, that's great, John. Um, well, hopefully, um, you know, you can melt some of that snow here soon and things dry out and you can get out in the field. And because, uh, um, yeah, I had to post that picture the other day of me spraying out there because <laughs> uh, I know you still had snow. So. <laughs> yeah, we. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, John. Well, hey, we'll have to do this again. Um, you know, if um, if guys are wondering about uh, doing any hinge cutting, just just to give a, a public service announcement, if for for guys that are concerned about it, you know, we've got the oak wilt period starting uh, April 15, runs for about three months to July 15, 
you know, for guys that have a lot of oaks on their property and if they're worried about oak wilt, you know, just beware of that. Otherwise, uh, it's on a property today that had no oaks at all, you know, so you pretty much cut any time. But anyway, sure. all right, John. Well, good. Um, I'm glad things are uh, busy over there. I may be taking a trip uh, into northern Wisconsin here in a couple of weeks, so I might be stopping by and picking up some seed and doing a seed run. Wonderful. There'll be room at the end, Randy. More than welcome to see All right. So looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> All right, John. We'll uh, we'll talk to you next time. Okay. Thanks, Randy. Really appreciate it. You bet. See ya.